All right. Hey, it is great to have Andy Arlotta on the show here today, co-owner and president of Georgia Swarm Lacrosse, and uh, kind of you know breaking into this market over the last many years uh, and telling a new message. Great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. All right. Tell me a little bit about uh, the Georgia Swarm and, uh, and lacrosse in our area. What does the club look like? How did it come about? Uh, let's dig a little bit, of de- a little bit deeply into there. Sure. Um, I, it, this is about our eighth season here in Georgia. Uh, two of those seasons were hit with um, the COVID right. issue, so we missed out on uh, playing two full seasons. But, uh, you know, we moved the team here eight years ago from Minnesota. Um, there we were there for about nine years, and um, it was an interesting transition. You know, we had about uh, three months to launch a new business wow. here in town. Um, luckily, I had about uh, five people that moved with me from Minnesota, um, and then a real supportive <laughs> you know, wife at at the time too. Um, But uh, it was, it's been uh, a great journey. Our second year here in town, we won our first uh, franchise world championship. Unbelievable. Um, So that, that was a great boost for us. And um, you know, the sport of lacrosse is booming. Um, It it really is. It is. It's, it's booming here in Georgia. That was one of the reasons why we relocated here to Georgia. Uh, we looked at a couple other um, states and, and we just found that, um, you know, Gwinnett and the uh, arena there and, you know, the growth of uh, lacrosse plus the, uh, you know, massive population here would be a, a good change for us. So you really picked it from a demographic perspective, not nothing else. No, no like wasn't a family decision. It wasn't, it was very much driven by the demographics. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Cool. Now you jumped in originally in a vice president's role and it's you and your dad, John, right? Who are, who are the, the co-owners of the club? Yes. Um, moving the franchise. Is that a, is that a, a huge ordeal? Is that something that is, I mean, I know that from a baseball perspective, football perspective, we watched clubs move uh, locations and it's just a monstrous undertaking. What does that look like in lacrosse? Sure. Well, the reason why we did it so quickly um, in our league, if um, you take a year off, you have to disperse your team. Okay. And you you lose the team you have. Um, So, you know, uh, my dad had been building this team for about seven years and uh, there was no way he was going to, you know, disperse our our team. So we had to really launch this team, you know, like I said, fast. And um, it was, uh, you know, most teams will disperse and, and the teams that do relocate, they have dispersed before and they take a year off to, you know, really ramp up and plan. And um, so, but we weren't about to do that. Now has lacrosse been in the blood for a long time? Like, cause I know you were a wrestler, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. so, so has lacrosse been something that's been burning on, on your heart? Uh, I know dad's been involved in lacrosse at, no- at Notre Dame. Uh, like what, what does that look like for you guys? I didn't know the sport at all before, um, you know, my father got involved at Notre Dame. Okay. Um, actually, he was living out in Baltimore uh, for a while with a company he worked with, and a friend of his introduced him to Johns Hopkins Lacrosse, and um, he fell in love with it right away. Um, also, my stepmom uh, is a, a Philly girl and um, played played lacrosse growing mm-hmm. up as well. So, you know, when my dad fell in love with it, um, he said he wanted to get more involved and, and do something at the University of Notre Dame that would impact, you know, both um, – men and women's sports and and lacrosse happened to be that that opportunity for him how did he get into the franchise like was that the two of you guys brainstorming that together or was that just by accident i i would say by accident okay. um <laughs> you know I, I i never dreamed that i would be in this position or you know even in this um, line of business but um like i said he fell in love with the sport a good friend of his um craig leopold um had just sold the nashville predators he ended up buying the Minnesota Wild, which at the time owned the Swarm. And um, he knew that my dad was a, a huge lacrosse fan. And at the time, he had a little um, time off uh, under a non-compete. So, um, you know, he, he came to me and said, hey, is this, this is something I want to do. Uh, would you like to do it with me? No kidding. And, um, you know, of course, I mean, what person wouldn't want to be in, um, you know, competitive arena uh, and business? Yeah. And your dad's a cool guy, so he's a good, probably a pretty great guy to work with, too. So, it, It's been great. I mean, it, really, it was my dream come true. Yeah. Um, but we, we both came from the healthcare industry. He's still, he's still there. Um, but, it, you know, it was always my dream to work with my dad. Yeah. Um, I just felt like, you know, there's a lot I could learn, uh, not just on the, the business side, but as a you know, man of character and 
just really how to be successful. And um, I always thought that would that would be in the healthcare industry right, right. At, at some point. And you know, um, this popped up, and it was like, wow. <laughs> now, what does so? What does it look like uh, from a recruitment perspective? Like, where where are you picking up your players? Are is is it as as crazy a hunt as it is, is as it is in like football, baseball, some of the other sports? Sure, you, you know, it's an interesting story. When we got into the league, um, you, you know, not one of these kids was um, a college graduate. You know, our league is is I'd say eighty percent Canadian. And we, we drafted those kids from the junior A, you know, senior A, senior B leagues up in Canada. Um, they weren't going to college. A lot of them were blue collar jobs, mm -hmm. um, firefighters, school teachers, you know, um, uh, that sort of thing, police officers. And, and today, I, we don't have a, a athlete on our team that isn't a college graduate. Mm. So that's been interesting. But back to your, your question on how do you, you recruit these guys? Yeah, we're exactly like the big leagues. I, I tell people that, uh, you know, the only difference is, is, is these guys aren't making the money that the big five, I'll say, mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. But that's grown significantly since I've been in the business as well. Um, you, you know, so yeah, uh, dad is our, our GM. And um, that happened about year three into the business. You know, again, we didn't know anything what we were doing. And, mm -hmm. and finally, he said, hey, this is something he wanted to do. That was part of his passion. And um, really, he, he travels Canada. He watches, you know, last night he was watching, you know, Canadian games up, you know, summer. That's when they, they play the game. And so um, he really scouts these guys, recruits these guys. And, um, you know, he's, he's become a fanatic about it, no which kidding. is, it's been cool. Um I'm always a step, a couple steps behind him when it comes to uh, the player side of the business, and and uh, sometimes I'm like, who who is this guy? <laughs> um, so you know, that's an area that I, I really um, I, I appreciate him, you know, coaching me in. As as a Canadian, you know, a lot, everybody misunderstands the the national sport in Canada is lacrosse, not hockey. Uh, surprise, surprise to the listening audience, but. It, yeah, and a, a while back they made, they made it the national summer sport, so yeah. that hockey, you know, obviously could could be in there as, right. as well. But yeah, now as these guys are coming in. What does that look like for them? Like, like I don't even know. Is there a contract margin that's normal in the league? Like, what are these players coming in for 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 contracts? We just saw with soccer some of the lunatic, you know, prices that went out of Messi and some other guys. Uh, I mean, what does it look like in lacrosse right now? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, these guys are unionized. So, you know, again, just like the, the big leagues. Huh. And, um, you know, we do have salary caps. And um, if you go above those caps, which you can, but you're going to pay a, a penalty like um, some of the other uh, leagues as well. But, um, you know, these guys will come in under a two-year rookie contract minimum. And um, after that, they'll, they'll be renegotiating. And, um, you know, there are guys in the league that can, you know, just take this season, this, this, you know, the NLL season and, and make a career out of it um, and a full-time living. There's not that many, but, um, you know, there are guys that can make that kind of money. Hmm. Wow. What's the NLL minimum? Oh, geez, it goes up every year. Um, I'm not going to say. I don't, I, I don't want to be quoted and then have a player say, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's not – give me a ball rate. Give me a it's ball It's in the 20s. Okay, in the 20s. And so it's something where they're probably doing something else on the side or playing in multiple leagues. Is that the way it works as well? Yeah, yeah. So they're I, playing in a summer league in Canada and then coming down here. Yep. What does the season look like here? Uh, we'll have the draft in September. Um then in November, we'll, we'll have training camp, and then December, we'll start up, and that'll go through April. Uh, we have um, 18 games, nine home, nine away. So cool. And then uh, May and June are playoffs. All of your away games are in the U.S. or some of them in Canada as well? Yeah, Canada. Um, let's see, we have uh, 15 <laughs> teams currently, and I think um, six of those are in Canada. No kidding. So you're, you're really traveling all over North America for this. Are you traveling with the team yourself? Typically, no. I'll, I'll stay back. Um, okay. I run the day-to-day -day business, so, you know, we're the front office is always working on that next game. Right. Um, and so, you know, unless uh, there's family involved, then, then I'll go on a, a trip. But for the playoffs, typically, yes. Right. Are, the, are any of your players, are they moving down permanently? And if so, like, what are they coming? Are they coming in on green cards? Are they coming, like, how does that work for you guys? 
Yeah, you know, that's been a, a huge learning experience for us. Uh, you know, that was another reason why we moved the team here. We felt like we would attract other players down in the south. Most of our teams are in the north, right? northern uh, uh, part of the country, and so it's colder. But, um, yeah, a lot of our guys want to move down here. Uh, for the season, at, at least, we have guys that move down here. Um, but there are guys now that want to live here permanently, and, and – you know, some of those guys are working on their green cards. Uh, you know, I've learned a lot about P1 visas, mm -hmm, H1 mm -hmm. visas. Right. And, and so um, we're in the process of um, trying to help a couple guys uh, attain those right now. So, uh, which would be great for the growth of lacrosse here in Georgia. Mm. I, I mean, you're talking about Division One All-Americans. Um, you're talking about MVPs of our league that, that want to be here. And, um, you know, for youth lacrosse here in Georgia, that's... That's pretty good. Um, I, I love the idea of just jumping in on, on really like the, the foundational base lacrosse. I mean, you're bringing it to the U.S., particularly to the, south, to the southeast. Uh, as we see kind of the growth of the sport, uh, are you guys involved heavily in youth programming? Like how are you promoting that idea? Because it's very much at the inception of, of the sport in this area. Sure. You know, it's been interesting. Uh, we've learned that, you know, some, a lot of youth lacrosse is a business out there. And um, we never wanted to, you know, compete with anyone out there. So we've, we've really stayed away from uh, the field lacrosse specifically, but we'll, we'll support them with providing coaches or, um, you, you know, clinics and whatnot. And, and, but on the, the box lacrosse side, that's another story. And um, we feel like that we could, um, you know, help grow that area specifically. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we've really jumped in. And, you know, when we were in Minnesota, we had a, a youth league that had 1,200 kids playing in the league. And it was the, the biggest in the country at the time. Um, here, we've waited a little little while. There was a, a company here in town that, that had a, a really successful program. We've actually just recently um, announced that we've teamed up with them. Mm. And um, we're going to provide you know, coaches, education, uh, player clinics, and really teach awesome. the box lacrosse game. So, so that the listening audience can understand, because I think people see lacrosse and lacrosse versus box lacrosse, which is what the competition is. It's box lacrosse, very different sport, very different speed. Uh, explain, explain kind of to the audience, just a little bit of the differences between lacrosse traditional and lacrosse box lacrosse. Sure. You know, um, well, obviously the, the main difference is one is indoor, one is outdoor. One is on um, the size of a football field roughly, and the other one is um, we just throw a turf over NHL ice. That's mm -hmm. why you'll see a lot of um, NHL teams that, that own uh, box lacrosse teams mm -hmm. as well uh, because it's a great transition. But in, in the box game, it, you know, like you mentioned, it's, it is a lot faster. Um, you're scoring 20, 30 goals a game. It's five on five with a goalie. Um, you're transitioning the ball a lot quicker. You're, you have two shifts an offense and a defense. So, you know, they're, they're coming out real quickly in, in transition of the game. So, um, you know, that, that's another big difference about it as well. Have you seen box lacrosse catching on with youth sports as well? Yes. Um, it's been interesting, uh, you know, um, we were on a call the other day and, and, um, uh, the coach said, Hey, you know, when, when our kids jump into box lacrosse, they, they've fallen in love with the game and they want to play more box lacrosse than actually field lacrosse, mm -hmm. which is, is typical. I mean, it's a little bit, you know, rougher and faster and, and, uh, a little bit more exciting, but, uh, you know, college lacrosse has been doing a lot of changes with putting in a, a shot clock, which we have right. in our league. So it's made made the game quicker and uh, more exciting. And, uh, you know, our game has a 30-second shot clock. You have to, you know, get the ball over the, the half field mark in eight seconds. And so it makes it a real quick game. It, it's interesting. There's so much discussion right now in sports where, like, for instance, with Major League Baseball, uh, there was such a decline in attendance uh, with fans and, and really the primary argument is the speed of the game in the same regard golf has, has really suffered you're, you're watching a ton of golf courses turned into condominiums uh, because the, because really the, the number of participants 
has decreased. And again, it's attributed to the speed of the game. Super intriguing that like with, with Major League Baseball, they're making some pivotal changes to speed up the game. Uh, and it's for that audience, you know, to really understand. So it, I, I'm super intrigued that, that as you guys come into this, you come into it with box lacrosse as just an action-packed, you know, like unbelievably fast-paced, exciting game format. Uh, and And... Are there other areas where box lacrosse is impacting lacrosse as well? Like you talk about the shot clock. Are there other areas where that's taking place? Yeah. You know, um, the stick skills are, are, you know, very impressive in box lacrosse. That's why a lot of the, you know, these Canadians and, and also the Native Americans, um, which represents about 10% of our league, um, you know, they're, they're born with sticks in their hand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it, hasn't been like that here in the U S and, and, you know, they grow up playing box lacrosse. So they're, they're learning a, a little bit different technique. Um, it, it's, you know, I'm not going to um, battle the U S versus Canada. Sure, they yeah. just had that in the world championships and field lacrosse in San Diego here. But um, it, you know, it's, it's uh, th- their skill set is, is really impressive. And, and again, that's why um, a majority of our league is um, Canadian. And, uh, but you'll see uh, a, handful of years ago, um, maybe 10 years ago, they, they called it the Canadian invasion in, in um, college lacrosse. And really, I think that was a big uh, push in, in growing the game. And so you had all these Canadian kids that are coming down into the States and really, you know, blowing up lacrosse here in, in the U.S. Hmm. Are colleges offering both field lacrosse and box lacrosse? No, um, not from a competitive level, but uh, you will see some of these teams, they will, they'll train box lacrosse. Mm. Um, maybe they have a facility that they can, you know, work on those things. I know there are teams out there that are, are doing that in the off season specifically. You, you know, the pick and roll is a big, big right. part of, um, you know, box lacrosse. And you've seen that really pick up in uh, field lacrosse here in the States, especially at the um, college level. So there are some things that have transitioned and trickled in there. And um, those teams that are picking those things up are typically, you know, pretty elite teams. Yeah, they're at an advantage. I mean, just again, the, just the, the speed that is required in box lacrosse for stick skills, for passing skills, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, it feels very different. You know, so I would imagine that gives them a real advantage. You know, all right, let's come to the business side of things. Um, You're jumping in, starting this new business. You've got a staff. You've got a lot of requirements upon you. Uh, When you're looking at kind of starting those businesses, our audience is both adults, but it's also a lot of uh, younger, younger high school kids who are listening in as well. When you're looking at some kind of providing advice to people who are who are doing startups, any kind of initial advice on entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs in the audience as well? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from uh, the first thing I would say is is in all professional sports or, um, you know, at the level of working in a team, it's um, it's a lot of hard work and, and you really have to be dedicated and, you know, very competitive person to jump in there. It's it's a grind, especially in, you know, um, the NLL, you mm-hmm. know, to a sport that a whole lot of people don't know a whole lot about. But you take some of these other leagues, too. It's a grind. I mean, look at baseball. Um, how many games they have. And, and so you have to be really wanting to do that and passionate about it. But um, I'll tell you, there's um, a lot of rewards too. I mean, it, I don't think there's anything cooler than being a part of a team mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, a team that can compete and a team that every year you're trying to grow, whether that's the front office from a season ticket standpoint or a fan base standpoint mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, sponsorship standpoint, you know, which all comes down to revenue. Um, and then on the field, you know, you're trying to build a world championship team franchise and, mm. and that goes hand in hand with the front office and, and, you know, the player side of the business. From an entrepreneurial perspective, you know, when I, when I finished up high school and then t- to a far lesser degree, uh, college, uh, I really mourned not being on a team, like, like, like just really missing being a just with the camaraderie of what a team looks like, what that feels like to have guys you feel like, man, we go to war every day with the, with each other, you know? Uh, I never I never anticipated seeing that same kind of camaraderie in a business setting. But when you are entrepreneurial, and particularly when you're trying to carve your own path uh, with a business, you end up having that with the people around you as well, which is such an advantage. Have you, have you been able to experience that already with the team? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's one employee that specifically that's been with me, I think 13 years now. 
And, um, you know, he and I have been through a lot together. And so that's, that's been, that's been really beneficial to, you know, the business, um, someone that has been there with you along the way that can, you know, really help out and help grow that business. So from that standpoint, absolutely. And, and again, from the, uh, you know, the player side, you know, we have, um, my dad, uh, came up with a saying saying that, you know, Hey, it, it, um, how does it go? It takes hard work or it takes talent to play in the NLL, um, but it takes character to play for the Georgia Swarm. Mm, I like that. And um, that's really how he's built this franchise, whether it's on the field or off the field. And, um, you know, there was a, a time early on where, you know, he took over as a GM and he said, hey, you know, look, we'll build this team on character. And if we can't win with character, we'll get out of the business. Mm. And uh, really that's kind of been the, the theme moving forward over the last you know, 15 years. And that's been obvious with your players. I, I mean, I know we've been talking about a few guys even coming on deck with us to, to help with our lacrosse program, which is, which is just starting out. Uh, but it, they're, they're character guys. I mean, they're just, they're just guys who have really, who have really expressed a ton of character. Um, before we press reverse and kind of go back to early Andy, uh, I would remiss to, to at least to put in there, tell us where you're playing, what the stadium looks like, where people can get tickets. Like, I want to make sure that we at least put a plug in on yeah. some of the, you know, for, for people coming out to see the swarm. Yeah, great. Thanks for that opportunity. It's uh, Gas South Arena in uh, Duluth, in, in Gwinnett there. And um, you can purchase tickets at uh, georgiaswarm.com or feel free to give us a call and, and we'll work with you. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's let's go backwards just a little bit. Let's just go backwards. You, This was not the the the, the kind of the course of your life. This was not what your trajectory was going to be. Uh, that's always a story I enjoy telling. As I'm working with teenagers so often, they think, you know, I'm going to choose a path. I'm going to choose a career uh, that that somehow I'm going to do a, a college major in, and then I'm going to be there forever. And, and you know, while, while that happened uh, 40 and 50 years ago, that just doesn't happen in today's day and age. We're a very mobile market. We tend to move careers. We tend to move jobs. We tend to move companies. Um, and so because we're so mobile, that's just not the the trajectory. So take me back to the earliest paths. Uh, what was your major in college? Why did you choose that? Uh, and 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 kind of how did some of those changes take place? Sure. Well, again, going back to, you know, the early days, like you mentioned, I always wanted to sell, mm-hmm. but, you know, I, I felt like that was exciting and, you know, challenging and whatnot. And so, you know, when I was in college, what degree do I get to uh, go just sell? And, uh, you know, to me, that was corporate communications. Um, at the time, I, I wrestled in college, too, so you had to balance both of those. And, um, you know, after after graduating, um, jumped in the healthcare industry, um, selling. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I think everything we do at The Swarm is, is selling. You're, you're trying to sell your product, sell the excitement, sell the energy. So, um, you know, that's that's been – I had some great experience with that, Um coming through the healthcare industry over the, you know, 10 years that I was in there. If you enjoy relationships, if you enjoy people, that tends to carry over no matter what industry you're in. You know, uh, the guys who, who tend to be so specialized, but they have neglected the relationship side of it. I think that's where sometimes people hit stop signs. That's a great point. Um, it's all about building relationships right. and, and, and not, I'd say in any business that you're in, whether it's your coworkers or whether it's a potential client or customer uh, it, it all comes down to building relationships and that's, that's, what's fun and exciting too. That's right. that's you know, right. that's part of it. Let's chat a little bit about, about how faith has played into your, your, your course and your path. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we try to put forth like this perfect image. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things on, on this show is we try to talk about the reality of what life sometimes looks like, you know, that it's imperfect people living imperfectly sometimes, you know, but let's talk a little bit about, about, what faith means to you now, how, how does that play into your role as a leader? Um, and then, and then we can press reverse too and see kind of what that trajectory has been. So talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you know, <laughs> this is, this is a, a, a really good topic and, um, it, it's the most important thing for me. Um, but I, I fail at it every day. Yeah. Uh, that's the way that, that I, I feel about it. Um, but I, it, every day um, I'm trying to, you know, build that relationship with Christ and, um, you know, learn and grow from that every day. And, and it, it's in every area of my life. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, 
giving thanks for the opportunities that, mm-hmm. that I've been given or the, you know, the family I've been blessed with and, you know, so many things out there and, and really recognizing that, Hey, this isn't my work. This is the creator's work. That's right. And, um, you know, that can, especially growing up without that mentality mm-hmm. and, and more of a competitive mentality, like hard work beats talent. Right. You, you know, sometimes I, I tend to forget that, Hey, this isn't me. That's right. This is, you know, he deserves the honor. He deserves the credit. And, and um, you know, at times it's, you know, been challenging. When did that change take place for you? Like, was there a, an event? Was it a particular time, a season in life? What, when, did, when, did that, when did that recognition, that realization dawn? I would say specifically about 13 years ago. Okay. Um, that was when I, I met my wife, Brooke. Um, you know, and I had, I had some exposure, uh, to Christianity. I always thought I was a, a Christian growing mm-hmm. up as a Catholic and a believer of God. Um, you know, where I really got exposed to it is, um, uh, in between my senior year and freshman year in college, I was, um, picked to be on a, it's called athletes in action. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, that's where I really got exposed to, um, you know, Christianity and what it looked like and what it, what it meant. And uh, I'll tell you, I felt a little uncomfortable at the time. Um, it was something new to me. And, um, you know, it wasn't until years later, till, um, you know, I met Brooke, that, you know, the first thing I said is, you know, I want what she's got. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. I, said, I, I just asked her one day, hey, you mind if I can go to church with you? And uh, this was when we were dating. And, and there it just kind of blossomed. That's awesome. Um, so, you know, it's been... Uh, growth ever since when i read your story i i thought that that athletes in action must have been a big seed planting time tell us a little bit about that because you get to travel the world a little bit travel the area uh as a wrestler but also bringing faith to it so give us kind of a nutshell on what that looked like it, it was fun um and it was it was a new world to me it was um that's why i'm saying that it was kind of uncomfortable because it was so new and you know i didn't come from you know that lifestyle right and, um, you know, but it was great. We were in El Salvador and Guatemala, um, third world countries. You know, most of the people we worked with didn't speak English, but we were there really to, you know, share our testimony. Right. And that's where I really learned about what your testimony can do and how it can impact people um, and, and really how to, you know, give your testimony. Right. Which, um, you know, that testimony has changed over the years, but um it's um it, it was neat it was a great experience it, it's it's pretty awesome to be able to like most people just need someone else to look at and say okay so that guy wrestles he's like me and yet his like his faith is real or at least it's growing you know and i think so often that's that's all a kid needs is, to, is for whether it's a young person who's considering becoming a businessman to say well, i know mr arlotta like i i know i see that guy i see him drop off his kids i see you know like I know that guy and I could do what he does, you know? So, so often that's really all it takes. And from a faith perspective, sometimes we tend to make things so complex. It all comes back to relationship again. It all comes back to that idea, just like relationships are crucial in business. The most important relationship is the relationship we have on a spiritual level uh, with our heavenly father. And that, and that, that changes things, you know? So, so we had kind of seed planted with, planted with athletes in action. Uh, you and I both share the same thing where we married up, we married great women. And, uh, and so, so in there, Brooke steps into the world and, and things change. How has faith grown? How, how has that become even more important in what specific ways? Yeah. When it, the, the, just make one comment too. you know, one of the things that really got me to a next level too, is, um, a CS Lewis book. Mm. Um, screw tape letters. Yeah. I love screw tape. Letters. Um, yeah. it, it, to be completely honest, I listened to it on tape. Yeah. Um, I, I heard it was a, a difficult read, but, um, it was an animated version. So, you know, that was a book that really helped me along, um, because there are a lot of things in there that, um, that I could, um, relate to. Right. And so that brought a comfort level, uh, to, you know, the, f- the growth moving forward. Um, but, and now I'm forgetting your question. <laughs> uh, just how, the how, yeah, the growth with growth with faith. Yeah, it's been um, it's been good. Again, I, I hold myself at, at a, you know a high standard, and I, I feel like you know I'm not where I want to be um, with that in, in my relationship. And 
Um, you know, especially now with kids, you know, I want to be able to teach them and, and help them grow in their faith and, and be a role model and whatnot. So, you know, in that area, I, I feel like I'm falling short, but, you know, I, I think I'm getting grace too. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of the day, I feel like the only thing that really matters is my personal relationship with, with Christ. Right. And um, he knows it. And, um, you know, that's, that's what's important. But that doesn't make me um, stop striving to grow in my faith and, you know, again, realize when I'm stepping out of that. Right. That arena. And that's what I've, I've always found in my own life is that if, if my relationship with Christ is in the right space where I'm, I'm actually in the word, I'm praying, like I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually really and truly making uh, that attempt to make, to make that a priority that ends up defining every other part of my life. Like when, when that's going well, my relationship with my spouse, my relationship with my kids, my vocational life, it, it just seems like everything else makes more sense, you know, because you're, you're seeing clearer. Absolutely. And, and, you know, one, one thing for me personally, being a part of this school, I'm getting to meet a lot of fathers that, um, you know, I can witness from them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that's been really, um, really good for me. Yeah. And, um, so that's been a neat thing about being a part of, of this community in this school. Yeah. Um, because you know, it's different from going to church and building those relationships here. I think you're seeing these, these fathers more often and, yeah. you know, more engaged with them. I mean, whether it's summer camps or sports or whatnot, or graduations, I mean, it's it's been a neat experience. You get to see the real real life struggles in a real world, and 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 yet still grow together. It, it's it's frankly one of the great benefits of being in Christian community is that, man, when I when I see folks and they're struggling, almost always, you know, they're they're not in Christian community. They don't have other folks who are holding them accountable for what that what that's going to look like, you know. And Christian Christian community is vital for everyone, but but I'll say just as 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 us as men. Uh, man, if, if left to our own devices, we're heading down the wrong path. Uh, but walking with Christ and then being in Christian community to hold us accountable really keeps that straight, you know, which is which is crucial. Um, all right, so hey, give me a picture of what's next for the Swarm. Do you guys have big plans coming up? Uh, what does the recruitment look like for this next season? How's, how's that going for you guys? Uh, we're excited. Uh, it, you know, I was just talking to my father last night, and um, we're in the process of, of signing, um, you know, three – MVP caliber players nice. that, you know, to longer term contracts that have been with us. So that's exciting. Uh, look, last year w- we had a rookie goalie that was, um, you know, they say he's top two in the world. And uh, he, no had a, he, had a, he had a tough start um, to his rookie season. But, you know, we started off 0-7 and, and then won the last eight out of nine games after that. And um, so, you know, we're really – we feel like he'll help us win championships and uh, that's really exciting. I think, um, you know, from an offensive standpoint, um, we're really excited. I mean, obviously, we have the best player in the world in Lyle Thompson. Um, so that's that's a, a plus on, on every level. And then we have another MVP on the left side, Shane Jackson. Um, potential MVP and Andrew Q, which is on the left side as well. Um, and then our defense, um, we have some great um, – leadership and guys that have been with our franchise um from day one in their careers that i think they're going into i don't know 14 years with us wow and so you know guys want to guys want to play for the georgia swarm right and guys want to play for my dad right and um you know we're, we're fortunate that um you know we have that character type of guy that that says hey i want to be here and i want to win and we can win but we're going to do it the right way yeah yeah that's awesome um are, are there are there challenges with the sales and different pieces like that? Like, how, do you have to handle all of that as well, uh, December through April? Uh, actually, um, that's when it's pretty good. Okay. Um, it, I, I, I've always said, hey, um, there is no off season. There's a preseason and an in season. Okay. We don't have an off season, so um, it, you know that's kind of been the mentality too. Um, as soon as the season is over, then the the, the grind really starts. Right. I that's my opinion, but you're out there building those relationships and, right. and and going back to the people that you know you've been. I mean, sometimes it takes two, three, four years to build that relationship to when you get the yes, we'd love to, um, sort of thing. So. Uh, this preseason is when I think a lot of the hard work is done. Once you get into the season, it's kind of, 
you know, on, you know, kind of track and we're still trying to sell, but, um, the, the hard work I think was done in the, from right. a front office standpoint. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see the, the franchise grow in this area. Uh, man, I'm excited just to jump in this next season and actually get over to some games and, uh, and actually see it take place. Box and cross is really exciting. I've watched it on TV a few times and, uh, and, you know, growing up, I I loved lacrosse, and we played we played lacrosse in club sports. It wasn't actually a sport at my high school, but absolutely loved it. So I'm excited to see what the what the franchise will do in this area, uh, just to see it boom uh, in the next few years. And so, Andy, I so appreciate you jumping on the show today, uh, giving us some insight on leadership, and uh, and also just telling the great story of what's taking place here with the Atlanta Swarm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.